Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Tuesday, January 30th, 2024. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski joins us now. Karen, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Welcome back uh, to the show. Uh, you and I have uh, discussed the uh, case of South Africa against Israel at the International Criminal Court. The court voted uh, 15 to 2 to say, well, don't do any genocide and 16 to one with the Israeli uh, uh, justice voting with the 16 uh, to demand a, a report in 30 days. I guess this is more symbolic than substantive, but did it burst any uh, self-proclaimed Israeli uh, aura of moral rectitude? Well, I think for much of the world it did. Um, you know, there was very little coverage of this in the Western media. And certainly I didn't see any news uh, in the American media about this at all. So um, I think for most Americans, we didn't get the benefit of, of actually having to look honestly at what is happening here. Um, much of the rest of the world, though, is, is viewing it, of course, uh, honestly and critically. And unfortunately, the United States is, is further lumped itself in with Israel's policy. So um, there's no daylight between the uh, United States and Israel at all. And the rest of the world sees this, and it's a loss of credibility for, for the United States, for sure. I mean, Alistair Crook uh, advises that this is still front page news on the websites and newspapers uh, in Europe, but you really don't see any mention of it here at all uh, any longer. I just wonder... Um, I mean, it's a, it's a court. It doesn't have an army to enforce its uh, its rulings. It only has the Security Council. The U.S. has a veto in the Security Council. We know how the U.S. would exercise that veto. But but there is still the PR war, which Israel is uh, severely, in my view, losing uh, internationally. Uh, yeah. This is another uh, strike against it. Long-winded question. My apology. Here's the short version of the question. Should the United States be on notice? Because under the, the genocide treaty, paying for genocide while knowing it's genocide is as guilty as performing the genocide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, what, what this really does is is continue the, the destruction of both, of the credibility of both of the political parties in the United States. You know, the Democrats have long been uh, supportive of the UN, supportive of the international court, uh, you know, wanting to become more involved. Of course, in this case, they don't. The Republican Party has has pushed away the, uh, we, we don't think it's credible, we don't care, George Bush and Dick Cheney were, you know, couldn't go places because of the ICC. Um, so they don't respect it anyway. But the Democrats did. So now we don't have any um, political parties that can, um, they're, they're in a different world. They're in a different space. And then the American people themselves, who I think in, intuitively understand which side is right here, uh, which side is conducting genocide and which side is receiving uh, the genocide that, that we're paying for. I think most Americans instinctively get that, but neither one of the main political parties are, are able to even articulate a thing about it. So it, it kind of shows the the weakness of our, our politics in this country. Um, I think the American people are good people, but, but the institutions that are between us and our government um, are bad institutions and they're weak. And this demonstrates how weak they are, I think. You, you and I have uh, argued and in in, in, in have both written in the same forums uh, that when it comes to war, there is no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. Well, there are some liberal... Sorry. Uh, progressive Democrats on the left and some libertarian Republicans on the right. You, you could name them. Uh, there are so few. But for the most part, it's one pro-war party. Now, just look at what uh, happened uh, over the weekend at the border of uh, Syria and Jordan uh, and the nearly universal cries for vengeance. All right, Lindsey Graham and that crew want to bomb Tehran and the Democrats want to be a little bit more moderate. Uh, but they all want us there uh, and engaged in war. What in the name of heaven and earth were we doing with a military base at the border of Syria and Ukraine? Uh, excuse me, Syria and Jordan. 
you know, we're ensuring uh, that the oil that we want to sell to Syria is being exported uh, properly. We're doing that. We're uh, fueling and training ISIS and, and some of the ISIS offshoots. Even though we say we're fighting ISIS, that's not true. And also, it's not just those few bases. I saw a map uh, the other day which said we had uh, 22 different bases in Syria and something like 16 or 17 in Iraq. So, you know, our... That, uh, that is 40 bases that are unlawful because we don't have right. the permission of the Syrian government. That's for that's sure. Right. And Iraq has many times asked us to leave. So 40 bases uh, in two countries uh, right there in, in the hot spot that may very well be the beginning of World War III or at least a wider war. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, and I forget. Is there been a congressional declaration of war that I missed? Kevin? Oh. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> wow. How, how could we have missed that? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, the Congress has been, uh, uh, you know, cheerleading all of this and, and allowing, they, they complain about the executive power on the one hand, but when it comes to uh, uh, making wars overseas and violating national uh, norms and, and fighting, they're all about letting the executive uh, do whatever it wants. Because, um, you know, again, our system, these most of these congressmen make money when there is a war going on. Uh, they make money and they get um, donations for their next campaign. Uh, they get invited to the parties they want to be invited to. And nobody criticizes them. I mean, look at what happens when a few uh, honest congressmen and senators stand up and say no war. Look at what happens to them. They're attacked by from every side and primaried. And, you know, so the whole system is a pro-war system, uh, which is unfortunate because I think it's a huge disconnect between what the American people want and what we are offered out of Washington. So uh, this morning in the West Bank, um, in a peaceful neighborhood of a uh, suburban town, a, a hospital was attacked. It was attacked by uh, Israeli intelligence officers dressed as healthcare workers. There's a scene in the hospital hallway dressed as healthcare workers and patients, male and female uh, Israeli uh, intelligence operatives. Uh, burst into a hospital room and assassinated three people, uh, two brothers and another uh, fellow, claiming they were Hamas leaders. Have you ever heard in your experience in the military or your knowledge of world history uh, of an attack on a hospital by a state actor to assassinate patients in the hospital where the country from which the state actors came and the country where the hospital is located are not legally at war with each other. I can't, I can't think of uh, an example like that. Um, you know, they say that things like this happen in active war in at the end of wars when uh, the losing side is desperate, you know, things like that. But to see it conducted consciously by what most people would consider the dominant player in this war, Israel, um, to see this kind of activity go on, it really spits in the face of any uh, any idea of uh, just war, any idea of trust between uh, opposing parties. I mean, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is amazing. And considering that this is our little project, the American project in the Middle East, this is the recipient of you know billions and billions of dollars every year. Um, we are funding their current war in Gaza, which has extended to the West Bank, which is extending to Lebanon. We're funding this. We are enabling this. So what they are doing is apparently acceptable to the United States. It's, it's certainly acceptable to the United States government. There's no doubt about that. So Here's, it's, um, it's pretty shocking. Say again? It's shocking is what it is. But it is I shocking. Think it's, it's sickening. It sick, makes you sick to your stomach. Uh, to think that uh, a patient in a hospital, which should be the safest, cleanest place in the world, uh, and somebody comes in and uh, machine guns you uh, to death. Uh, I don't know if Joe Biden's been asked about this yet. We have a clip of him being asked uh, what he's going to do uh, with the uh, attacks on the American uh, troops at the Syrian-Jordanian uh, border. 
And well, we'll run that clip. It's just about a half an hour or an hour old. He really doesn't answer anything. And it shows him being a little out of it and, and simply teasing with the press. Chris, do we have that clip? Yes. I do hold respons them responsible in the sense that they're supplying the weapons to the people who did it. Well, we'll have that discussion. Why do you think that the attacks in the past? What will be different We'll see. Well, he doesn't really uh, answer anything. Uh, your colleague, Matt Ho, surmises <laughs> that the uh, passage of time between the deaths of these American soldiers and the present uh, is to get the um, Americans time to, um, to get assets in place. It may also take some time to confer with uh, other countries. I mean, I don't know what countries they're going to confer with, but uh, there'll be problems in Moscow if they listen to Lindsey Graham's advice and bomb Tehran, I would think. The Russians and the and the uh, uh, Iranians have a handshake on a deal. It's not yet signed, but a handshake on a mutual defense compact. Yeah, that's uh, it's going to be a problem. You know, it's interesting, though, that um, Biden, for all of his incompetence, um, said very clearly that he holds Iran responsible because they are funding Hamas. Ah. In his, this is his words. He just said that. So clearly he's not stupid enough. I mean, he's not so stupid, I guess, that he doesn't understand that's exactly what we're doing um, in terms of this genocide in, in Gaza. And as the war extends uh, and we participate on the side of Israel, you know, we're we're doing exactly the same thing. So, you know, I, I think it's it's not clear. You know, Iran has denied funding and planning any of these attacks, but, you know, we have it. So in a sense, if any of those countries decide to react, we, Joe Biden admits we're clear targets. We are fair game uh, in terms of, of their uh, response to Israel. We are certainly fair game. And he's, he's as much as said that. Now, you know, it's hard to say what he's thinking at any given time. He seems, uh, I think he struggles. Well, Karen, um, Colonel, this is a brilliant analysis. Uh, if Iran is responsible for the Houthis or whoever it was that attacked the American troops because Iran paid for it, then the United States is responsible for the genocide in Gaza now spreading uh, to the West Bank. That, out of the mouth of the President of the United States, of course, he didn't add the second part in there. He can't do that and expect to get away with it politically. Uh, but his rationale... Uh, his rationale is right there. How reckless will it be uh, if the United States attacks, listens to Lindsey Graham and co and attacks Iran? Well, <laughs> you know, from a military perspective, it's extremely reckless. Um, and I'm sure what they're trying to do is to have some sort of symbolic strike. Uh, very much in line with how Israel has has struck in the past uh, inside of Iran. Um, you know, the symbolic strikes, maybe they hit this target or that, um, and then they, they pull back. Because from a military perspective, we're not going to engage Iran in a war and prevail. That's not going to happen. Um, the whole world is not going to allow that to happen, number one, because of the importance of, of that part of the world for energy flow and that kind of thing. But uh, even if we had many friends in the world, which we no longer do, but Assuming we had many friends, we still, from a military perspective, cannot uh, take over Iran. We cannot control Iran. We cannot physically, with an army, invade Iran. And there's most places in Iran we can't destroy from the air or from the sea. So it's kind of a dead end in terms of a military action. So I don't think that anybody in the military is going to say, OK, let's do a let's pull a big Zelensky, you know, and wipe out our entire military um, because we want to. Uh, go up against this enemy that we really have no hope uh, against, you know, getting our way. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I think it'll be a symbolic response and I hope it will be a symbolic response because at least if it is that, then we can still be talking to each other. We can still, um, 
move forward because if it is an out of control uh, uh, response that then engenders a global response against the United States, we are not in a good position to, uh, to, to really uh, do well in that situation. Here's a, um, a cut. It's long. It's two and a half minutes, but it's worth watching and listening to. Uh, number six, Chris. This is a back and forth between Admiral Kirby uh, in the White House earlier today and a, a journalist by the name of Kimberly Halkett, uh, who is an American but works for uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, these are questions that John Kirby does not want to answer. Uh, and you will you will see from the look on his face and you will hear, you will watch his body language, and you will hear his words. He does not want to answer this woman's questions, and the questions are spot on. You said that the president, in his response, has authorization under Article 2. Does that mean that he's planning to bypass Congress in any matter of war in terms of this response? I'm not going to get ahead of his decision making. Um, he has the authority under Article, ter Ar Article 2 as commander in chief. And as we have in the past, so we will in the future, appropriately inform uh, leaders in Congress about what we're doing in, in keeping with that authority. Okay, so I just want to follow up because the president was sent a letter on Friday from a bipartisan group of lawmakers, and he had been accused of unauthorized strikes against the Houthis in a, by bypassing Congress. It, they said no president, regardless of political party, has the constitutional authority to bypass Congress on matters of war. Do you think that that would apply here, given this escalation? We're not at war with the Houthis. We're not going to be. A, we're not looking for a war with Iran. The president is comfortable that he has the appropriate legal authorities to act in self-defense of our ships, our sailors, and our troops, and our facilities at sea or ashore. Right. Isn't it time to involve the American people? I mean, given the fact that the American people <coughs> were not happy about, I mean, all I suspect the American people are not happy about attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea. I also suspect they're not happy about seeing American troops killed uh, at a base in Jordan. The president has the authority to defend those troops in those facilities, and he'll do that. He's weighing all of his options. This is an election year. Is the president looking at his polling when he's weighing all of these options, is the president looking at Man, what? My goodness, that's a heck of a question. He's not, not really. looking, ma'am, ma'am, really. ma'am. Let me just stop you right there. Let me finish my the commander in chief is not looking at polling or considering the electoral calendar he's when he's defending. At how they feel about the war on Gaza? Oh, now can I answer the question? He's not looking at political calculations or the polling or the electoral calendar as he works to protect our troops ashore and our ships at sea. And any suggestion to the contrary is offensive. Is he looking at the polling with respect to does the American public want a broader Middle East conflict when he weighs his political decision making? Ma'am, I've answered that question. Okay, let's go. No, you didn't answer that question. Is he weighing that? He is not concerning himself uh, with the political calendar. Does the American public have the opportunity to weigh in on whether they want made I, in America I have stamped answered on your, the bombs that are going to be dropped. We're going to move on. Go ahead, Phil. Thanks, Green. Uh, well, I thought she was uh, terrific. Does the president want to start a war? Does he want to start it on his own? Doesn't he realize he has to consult with the Congress? Does he think the American people want another war? These are profound and legitimate questions, which his boss on on the ellipse of the of the White House about to get on the helicopter could not answer. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting how angry Kirby got when they suggested that the political calendar of 2024 is part of any of these decisions that he's making. And, and it absolutely is. It, it is, the whole world is watching the United States political calendar. Um, you know, our elections, and of course, I think a third of the countries in the world have elections uh, in the fall or sometime in 2024, but the United States elections are being talked about globally. There's no doubt. So, so you know, we have we have a president who is uh, attempting an unprecedented run for re-election. Um, you know, where he, first when he campaigned from his basement, and this one he has clearly got medical issues. He's continuing to to uh, insist that he will run. They are shutting down other Democrats. They're you know in the primaries. They are trying to block RFK Jr., who would be a very attractive candidate for either party, really, but 
certainly he comes from a democratic tradition, they're blocking him from even getting on ballots in, in any of the states. You know, they're worried about Trump with this, the, the huge number of, uh, you know, lawfare and, and legal uh, attacks and, and uh, reputational attacks, you know, the whole business with, with everything they can do against Trump. That is everything the United States is talking about at home. And it's a lot of what the foreign countries are talking about. So Kirby got a little bit uh, uh, unhappy with that question. And I think it's because we were over the target. Somebody was over the target with that question. Um, clearly, this is the major topic of conversation. Can Biden take this country to an unpopular, unnecessary, un illegal, unlawful and illegal war in the last eight months of an election year? in which he's running for president for re-election with the lowest popularity numbers that we've seen uh, for, for most presidents. I mean, he's, he's pretty, I don't know if he's the lowest, but he's, he's among those. So uh, uh, cl clearly Kirby got a little upset. And I guess maybe it's because Kirby's job is at stake. You know, I mean, maybe Kirby wants to work for another eight months and, and he values his job. I don't know. But, um, you know, the idea that, that this is uh, an illegal action, this article business is not, that's not valid. OK, um, it hasn't been valid. You know, the way they misuse the War Powers Act since Nixon has not been valid. This is this is an abuse of power. Um, you know, the Americans should be concerned and people like this reporter should be asking questions like this constantly. And actually, just from watching that, I think that uh, more people will try to get under Kirby's skin. Clearly, that was a uh, Kirby was. Um, did he what did he say? Offended. He was he thought it was offensive. Right. Yeah. He needs right. to learn the meaning of that word offensive, considering you, what his administration is doing in Gaza. You uh, argued uh, right before the we ran the uh, Kirby clip with the uh, reporter from Al Jazeera that the United States could not sustain a war against Iran, either on the ground, from the sea, or from the air. Is that a generally universally held view uh, in the military? Uh, does the White House understand that? Are we about to see sort of pinpricks or are we about to see a, a, an ill-fated invasion? Well, the invasion part is, I know when I was in the military and <clears throat> anyone who studies the geography and the politics of that region, the United States Army, Air Force, Navy, Navy and Marines are not going to ever invade Iran. They're not going to do it successfully. It is almost an impossible act. I mean, we talk about a two front war, a three front war. We couldn't do that if it was a single front war and all of our forces were focused on that. It is just impossible to do that um, with with what you face in Iran. I mean, Iran actually has a, uh, you know, they have a society, they have an economy, <laughs> they have a lot of people, but it's the geography that is the hardest part. So there is no taking of Iran. That's not going to happen. Um, in terms of sustaining uh, pinpricks or maybe one degree above a pinprick, the sustaining of any type of military action in the Middle East, so far from home, uh, with increasingly people that aren't going to give us flyover, they're not going to give us, uh, they're trying to kick our troops out of their countries. Um, they're targeting our supply depots that are in forward uh, locations. Increasingly, sustaining such a such a uh, any type of long-term thing is not going to happen in fact we can't even from what i understand we cannot even sustain the operation in the red sea based on the rate of consumption of our resources uh, particularly the weapons that we're firing against the the houthis and and whatnot but the fuel the maintenance of the ships and the navy which that's largely a navy operation has historically been a little bit better than the, than the uh, army in recruiting. They are they're down. They can't even recruit people. They can't recruit people and train people. So the sustaining of what is in the minds of our government. They have this vision. We can do this and we can do that. They must have read it in a book. In reality, uh, we don't have the ability to sustain um, nearly anything that they're imagining. We cannot continue. And as we saw with Ukraine. Even though we've had two years to pump up our production of certain munitions and weapon systems that we want to give to Ukraine, we haven't been able to bring it up to the level that would even help that country. So this this is it, it really is insanity. 
And uh, it, it's not necessary that it be this way. The facts are there, but I, I don't think we have leaders in the Pentagon who are able to communicate to this. And I think they're so ideological about what it is they're trying to do and what they think they have to do, again, because it is an election year, that it's just, it's just uh, you know, we cannot communicate with our own government and they will get us into trouble. Well, this is very important, Karen. Uh, Ray uh, McGovern and Larry Johnson have been telling us for two years that the intelligence community uh, tells the White House what they think the White House wants to hear, even if it's the opposite of the raw intel on the ground and from other sources. Question, is the military the same way? Will the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from the Air Force uh, tell President Biden, oh yeah, we can invade Iran, we can do this, we can do that, or will they tell him an unvarnished version like the one you just gave us? No, they won't tell him an unvarnished version. And I think we saw this just a little bit in a small way. The Secretary, the, the Secretary of Defense could not even bring himself to tell Biden he's going to be in the hospital, that he, had, that he had to be taken, you know, he had a relapse and he had to stay in the hospital for two weeks. He couldn't tell his own boss that. Um, why, I don't know. W would the boss be upset and say, no, no, you can't do that? Get I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is. But that inability to communicate, even on matters of limited importance, I think that is reflected throughout the whole system. So on matters of great importance, no, no, they're not communicating. Well, maybe, you know, maybe it'll go away. And again, we saw this with Trump as well. When, when Trump said to the Pentagon, I need you to pull his troops out from here or there, which because his whole effort was very much something the Pentagon did not support. What did they tell him? Oh, we got it. Yeah, no problem. We're, we're on that boss. Yeah, it's happening. It was not happening. So it's not just that they won't tell him the truth that they will lie to them for their own agenda. That agenda, unfortunately, is not a pro-America agenda. It is not an agenda that defends this country, and it's not an agenda that um, is held by the people in this country. We, we want a military that defends us, and we certainly, certainly expect our officers to tell the truth at all times, and we don't, we're not getting that. Colonel Kwiatkowski, a pleasure, my dear friend. No matter how unpleasant these uh, issues are, <laughs> thank you for your... Uh, candor and unique perspective. Please come back again, same time, uh, same day next week. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. All the best. Another, from my view, wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation uh, because of our uh, enlightened guest, uh, a hero to many of you in an hour at 4.30, Scott Ritter, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. <laughs>